Today we're going to uh, continue looking at this word grace, and uh, until uh, the Lord releases me of it, we will continue to do so. I think we're, we're nearing the end here, um, but this week we're going to look at having grace for labor and looking specifically at the story of Ruth. But before we get to that, I want to ask you a few questions, and if you ever feel like you're working so hard that you don't see any results? Ever feel so tired because you feel like you're spinning your wheels? I'm here to tell you today that there is grace for the work that you're intended to do. Sometimes things that seem difficult and, and we may not be getting the results that we want may not be the direction the Lord has called us to do. Other times, we just need to ask for the grace for those things to do. There was a, a young man at, uh, that went to school with CJ. He's his age, and, and he has uh, recently been set in as the children's pastor at a at an assembly's church out in, in Brighton. And uh, I thought to myself, <laughs> this is really not good for me to say out loud, does anybody ever grow up thinking, I really just want to be a children's pastor? And, I, and I, the Lord has given some people special grace for that. And so I think that's a perfect example of that, right? That if you don't have the grace for that, sometimes it may seem difficult and laborious. But the Lord has given grace to some, and, and to others, they do it out of a, a wanting to serve. And in doing so, the Lord can give you grace in that. Because it's so important. You know, we have such an emphasis here in our kids. We never, we always want them to feel like they have a place because they do and they're a part of the house because they are. And so those that do um, work in, serve in the nursery as well as in Sunday school, we appreciate you. I know the parents do. They all say amen. And, uh, but the word that is going forth over their, those young lives, and I can tell you as a product of this house from day one, that your labor is not in vain. So if you're fear, feeling worn out or tired or, oh, it's my week, I have to do Sunday school this time, we just pray grace over you. Do you recognize the impact that you're having over those lives? The next generation, repeating the goodness of the Lord to the next generation so that we don't fail, so that we can sustain 76 years. If the goodness of the Lord is not repeated to the next generation. This house doesn't sustain that long. So we appreciate you. So the Lord gives you grace upon grace for that. In Psalm 127, verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor in vain, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. All the plans, all the things we want to do in our January meeting when we plan out the entire year, if we're not seeking the Lord's direction, if we're not asking Him for all the things that we are to do, if we aren't in tune to His voice and listening for His direction, all those things that we have planned out are in vain. All the messages we prepare, all the worship songs we sing, the Lord's not in it. There's really no point in us gathering at all. But we're grateful that He visits us. We're grateful that he speaks and that we are hearing from him because the Lord has built this house and he will continue to build it moving forward. If you want to turn in your Bibles, we're going to look in the book of Ruth and spend the majority of our time there today. One way it's easy for you to remember where it is, you can remember that Joshua judged Ruth, which he didn't, it's not accurate, but it helps you remember where it's at. Joshua judges Ruth. This is a familiar passage, I know, for a lot, especially the ladies that went through the Bible study some months ago about the book of Ruth. But I wanted to revisit that story and look at how the, the theme of grace for labor, grace for working, is woven throughout this passage. But to kind of give us some context and as a review, what is happening here and what is going on? So we have... 
This guy's name is Amalek. His wife's name Naomi, and they, there's a famine in the land, and so they go, and they um, go to a foreign land. And it, they, those two, they have two boys. And the boys find wives, and they get married. Well, a short time after being there, Naomi's husband dies. And then 10 years later, it says in chapter 1, both her sons die as well. And so here we have these three women who are without husbands, uh, without really any means to provide for themselves. And so they had significant need. And so they were exceptionally sorrowful. And so Naomi says to these girls, listen, I would have no problem if you would just go back to your hometown. Go back home, find you another husband, that's not a problem. I release you to do that. And they say, no, we want to stay with you. And she says, listen, even if I were to get married tomorrow and to have some sons, are you going to sit around and wait for them to grow up, grow up old enough to be of marrying age? Go. I want you to go. So there were two, as I mentioned. One of them says, okay, you know what, I'm going to go. And there's another that stays, though. And she says some very famous words. And I want you to, I want to read these to you. We may not have it to project because I didn't initially plan on it. But in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16, it says, Ruth says, Entreat me not to leave you, or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Watch this. And your people will be my people. And more importantly, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I'll be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. We have this beautiful story of, of loyalty that Ruth has to Naomi. And here she has someone who is not necessarily raised in all these things, but she saw something in this family. She says, I want to be a part of it. Your people are now my people. Your God is my God. When we allow the Lord to build a house, He gives us the grace for our labors. I want to show you something before we continue on route. Just pause that for a second. And it's good to know the historical background of what's going on in, in certain things. So if you look in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10, there is a principle that is set forth here for public assistance. Watch this. Leviticus 19, verse 9 says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of the harvest. And you shall not glean in your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of the vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Here's what it means. So imagine, they weren't, but just imagine for a second that every plot of land was a perfect rectangle. And so they would, they would go and they actually, you know, they had their ox or their cattle or whatever it was that they were using. And not only was it a principle of the Lord, but also logistically it was a lot easier. All of my days of farming, you know, I'm very familiar with this. But as I, you know, I have the straps and everything and I have my, my yoke and and uh, we're going through, and as we come through and we're getting ready to harvest this, it's a lot easier for me to turn as opposed to coming directly to this corner, backing everybody up, trying to turn everybody on a, on a 90 degrees, and then go this way, right? So logistically, it was easier for them to approach that corner, turn, and then come this way, approach another corner and turn, right? As a result of that, there left this section of their field that was unharvested. That was the logistics of it. But the Lord also plans a lot of things out. He's kind of smart. <laughs> In doing so, what they did was they left those portions of their fields, those four corners, for those that didn't own a field. 
those that didn't necessarily have a way to a place to glean from. So that's why I say this is how God intended public assistance to be. He provided a way for those that didn't necessarily have a way to, or a place to grow, a place for them to be able to harvest. Now, here's the difference. I still have to go out and harvest that corner. It doesn't say, go ahead and sit back home on your couch. We'll bind it all up for you and we'll deliver it to your front door. Here's your public assistance. It still says, if you don't work, you don't eat. So, what it said is, here's an opportunity for provision, but you still got to go out and kill it. So this is what happens. This is, when we pick up in chapter 2, this is what Ruth is doing. Now, she had no source of income. She was a woman. She was a widow. She was a foreigner. She was a Moabite. And they were in Bethlehem. She was considered the lowest in society. However, she heard there was a man named Boaz who was a relative of Naomi's late husband and he had a field, one of his fields. He was very wealthy, but he was known for his generosity and his integrity. So here is what's happening here. Ruth goes to glean from one of Boaz's fields. And one day, she's doing so, and Boaz comes into town. He notices her and inquires as to, who is this woman out in the field? Now, I mentioned you, if you read the context and go through, there are many people there. There are other women, because it mentions that. But he just so happens to notice this one particular one. She caught his eye. And they tell him, he's like, who, who is this? This is all in chapter 2, you can read. So those that work for him say, oh, that, that's the girl that, that was, is Naomi's daughter-in-law and, and remained loyal to her and stayed with her even after the death of her husband and, and her father-in-law. So he's intrigued by what's going on. And she asks if she could glean in one of your fields, and she continues to work. She's a workhorse. She's still even to the late into the evening. So let's pick up in verse 8, this conversation between Boaz and Ruth. He says, Boaz says to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go glean in any other field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young man not to touch you? When you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Now, I usually don't like to do this, but I want you to see the parallel of what's going on here. I don't like to give away punchlines, but I'm going to tell you because I want you to see it. Boaz is a picture of Christ. And Ruth is us. I'm going to read this passage again, and I want you to recognize that parallel. And Boaz says to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go glean in any other field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? Has the Lord commanded that we can't be touched? He's our protection and provider. He's provided a place for us to be and said, don't go anywhere else. Everything you need is right here. <clears throat> can't, can't see very good. All right. And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. 
It was her response. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me that all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you left your father and mother in, land, in the land of your birth, and have come to a people whom you did not know before, the Lord repay your work. He sees your faithfulness. He sees your labor. He sees your loyalty. And a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Notice it says here, you didn't come to my wings. He didn't say, you've come to my field, you've come for refuge to me. But he said, no, you've come into refuge of the Lord. This is this humble man, Boaz. He was looking out for her. He wanted to make sure that she was well cared for. Later on, Boaz, if you continue reading, Boaz says to his servants, he says, hey, when you're gathering up, make sure a little bit falls off the wagon. Right at, at Ruth's feet. She can have a little extra. So she gathers a harvest for the day. She beat it out and ended up with an ephah of barley, which I did a little, I asked the Google about some things, and an ephah is the equivalent of, of uh, a bushel. And then I said, okay, Google, how much bread, how many loaves of bread can you make from a bushel of barley? Now, by the way, in chapter 1, you'll read that it is the beginning of the barley harvest. So that's what's happening. How many loaves can you make out of a bushel of barley? The answer is 42. That's just what Google says. I have no idea whether to substantiate that at all. But it was a lot regardless. And we know that it was a lot based on Naomi's response when she got home. She's like, where'd you get all that? The provision that the Lord was giving these women. It was a pretty good day. She went home and told Naomi all that had happened. Let's jump down into chapter 3. Verse 1, And Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young women you are with, is he not our relative? That's important. We'll see in a minute. In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. He said, okay. Get your, she said, go ahead. Get yourself smelling good. Put on your best outfit. And then she says something that I want to make sure we understand the context of what is happening here. Um, Charlotte left to Sunday school, so Megan and Anthony, would you guys mind... You, me using you as a demonstration? I need you to come up. Okay. Anthony, I need you to lay down. <laughs> uh, on the floor like this, like um, like by the baptismal line right there. That's good. Uh, no, on your back. Put your feet toward this way. Okay. So I did a little research on this because I've actually all, often thought this kind of a weird concept of what happens. So what Naomi tells her and says, listen, Boaz is down on the threshing floor. And he is oops, going to be eating. You know, actually, I need to scoot that way. Your wife's your wife tall. Okay. All right. He's going to be, he's going to be well fed. He's going to get tired. And then what I want you to do is I want you to go and uncover his feet and lay at his feet. Now, this is, in me looking at this, I always thought this was kind of a, a forward action. But there is actually nothing, making sure that there's no children in the room, there's nothing sexual about this at all. It's actually an act of servitude. So what she did was she would go and she uncovered his feet
you can lay whichever way you want. And she would lay at his feet, perpendicular to him. There you go. Now, and then she says, watch what he will command of you. What does he do next? Does he kick you away and say, woman, get away from me? <laughs> or does he welcome you in? Which is what Boaz does. First he's like, who, who is that down there? But then he recognizes who she is. And what this is, <laughs> woman, who dat? Who dat? <laughs> but what she is saying is, I am at your mercy. I am here to serve you. Thanks, guys. I was going to get you a, a pillow or something, but I didn't want you to. But Naomi says, get down your best outfit. Make sure you're smelling good. And you're going to go. And if he doesn't kick you away, then you are good. It was an act, as I mentioned, of total submission. Let's look at verse 8 again in chapter 3. Now it happened at midnight that the man, had, the man was startled and turned himself, and there was a woman lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? She said, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for, I, for you are a close relative. Remember that. We're going to get to it. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Okay. Now, why he mentions that, there was a duty that was laid out in Deuteronomy 25. Make a note, we're not going to go there, but I'll tell you what happens. It says that if you're married, and so Aiden, listen to this, okay? CJ is married to Kylie. CJ dies. It is your responsibility to marry Kylie. It says it in Deuteronomy 25, you argue with the Lord. Now, if you don't have a brother, then there was a, your nearest male relative was to take that role. What the purpose and the function of that was to keep the family name going. Okay? That's why they had to do that. So this was commanded in Deuteronomy 25. So that's why it keeps on mentioning your nearest relative, your nearest relative. Okay? So we have the situation where uh, Ruth's husband dies, no children, so they want to keep, they weren't really concerned about Ruth's family name. They wanted to keep the name of Elimelech going forward and his boys, right? So they wanted to keep that family line moving forward. So with that in mind, this is what they're talking about. So let's pick up in 14. So what happens after this is... Um, he, I'll just comment here. So what he does is he takes and he says, all right, bring a shaw in. I'm going to give you some more grain. So then he takes and he gives her a bunch of grain again. She takes it home and Naomi's blown away. Can't believe all this stuff. It's provision that she keeps on getting. And so he wanted to once again make sure that all her needs were provided for. Who is Boaz again? Who's Ruth? wanted to make sure that all her needs were provided for. Now, I'm not going to ask you to define it. Come up here up front. But I would like you to honestly answer. How many of you, because I could not before this week. I've heard the expression my whole life. But I could not adequately articulate what the concept of a kinsman redeemer was. I thought I knew. My whole life, heard it. But how many of you think that, yes, I could explain to somebody who has no idea what it means what a kinsman redeemer is? Raise your hand. 
Small amount of people. Okay, Pastor, you should have raised your hand. Okay. I'll break down the word for you. Kinsman, relative. Redeemer, one who pays a debt. That's what that means, okay? Put the two together. Why is that important? I'm glad you ask. Being a, a widow, Ruth was in need of a redeemer. She grew up hearing this. Or as I mentioned, I grew up hearing this expression. So I want you to be able to fully be able to articulate. So my goal next week, if I were to ask that question, how many of you can articulate what a kinsman and redeemer is? All of you will shoot your hand up and know exactly what's going on. Here's what it is. Their responsibility was to safeguard three things. One, the person. Two, their property. And three, the posterity of the family. As I mentioned, a kinsman is a near relative. The redeemer is the one that pays the debt on your behalf. Boaz was Ruth's kinsman redeemer. He would protect her and her integrity. He would redeem the property of her late husband's family that they owned that she had no means to pay for. He would redeem the family line. She had a, are you hearing me? She had a massive debt that she could never pay. And he agreed to pay it in full, relieving her of the obligation. Does that sound kind of familiar? We are in desperate need of redemption. Sin attached an insurmountable debt on our back that we have no means in which to pay. Jesus comes along and pays it in full. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. The Lord spoke to me this week about that passage. and Changed some of the words a little bit. He who was glorious became disgusting so that we who are disgusting might be glorious. Hmm. He's our kinsman redeemer. Let's look at Ruth 4. When we, we see Naomi return from Moab, she's poor and in debt, her nearest redeeming relative was willing to buy back the land for her, but stopped short when he found out that he had to marry Ruth and raise up an heir for the property. Now, mind you, Boaz says, yes, I'm your kin, but there is one who is nearer. So that's who they're talking about here. When the nearest redeeming relative did not fulfill his obligation, Boaz was the next nearest kinsman. He fulfilled his responsibility out of his love for Ruth. Now, as I mentioned to you before, in Deuteronomy 25, it's laid out that if a, a guy dies or doesn't have any heirs, then the next brother in line or the next kin well, is to their obligation is to marry that, that uh, wife or that woman. If they did not do that, you were to do two things. You were to spit in their face and take one of their sandals so that they could walk around with a flat tire all the time and everybody would know why it is because they had a responsibility that they shirked. So, in chapter 4 here, we see Ruth's nearest relative, well, technically, Elimelech's nearest relative comes into town, and Boaz is very anxious to find out what this guy's going to do. He's standing there waiting at the gate for him, hoping and praying that this brother says no. So he comes through. Okay, you're the, the kinsman. Great, I'll take some land. I'll, I'll deal with that. By the way, there is a woman attached to it as well. I'm good on that one. 
That'll mess things up on the home front. So he denies, he declines his responsibility. Now, Boaz doesn't spit in his face, but the guy does willingly give up his sandal and they recognize this is what's happening. So now Boaz is like, yes, I'm next in line. Why? Because Ruth is amazing. Let's pick up in chapter, or verse 9 of chapter 4. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Emelech's and all that was in Shilion's and Malon's, those are the brothers, and the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as a wife to perpetu perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses of this day. He was letting everyone know that he was redeeming this land and the family. He was going to take Ruth as his wife. So I asked the question today, why, why does any of this even matter? Why is this story in here? What, what, is, what are we supposed to draw from this? Beyond the basic theme, what is it that we're supposed to look at? Well, if you continue reading in, in chapter 4, Boaz and Ruth eventually marry, and they have a son whose name is Obed. That name should be familiar to you because... He has a son named Jesse, who has lots of boys, the youngest of which, David. And we know who comes directly from the line of David. Now, why would it be that this Boaz guy would be so smitten by Ruth? She was a woman out of place. She was an outcast. She was a foreigner. Well, I'll tell you why. Because it hit really close to home. Boaz's mother was an outcast as well. She had a sordid past of which most would not be proud, nor would most want to associate themselves with her. You see, she was a prostitute that used to hang out at the gate of the city and welcome in travelers. She was a prostitute that saw a light. She came to the light. She heard stories of the victories of the Lord was bringing of the God of Israel and said, our hearts did melt. Neither did we have any more courage because of you. You see, she hid the spies in her home on the wall of Jericho. Because of her choices, her life, her life and the lives of her family were spared. Boaz's mother, as some of you are whispering and turning and saying, was Rahab. This harlot that was in the line of Jesus. Out of this sordid past came a wonderful, virtuous woman in Ruth who saw it fit to redeem, or a virtuous man, excuse me, saw it fit to redeem a widow and take her as a wife. Out of the trash heap of the choices that Rahab had made, she made the next right choice, and in doing so, changed the trajectory of her family. You may have made some terrible choices in your life. You may have a history that you're not necessarily proud of. There may be things in, the past, in your past or in your family's past that you would rather sort of forget. I'm here to tell you that God humbled himself and became a man. He set down his crown of glory to pick up a crown of thorns. He stepped down from his throne to sit on his mother's lap. The one who holds the universe in his hands was wrapped up in the arms of a teenager. He became the second Adam because the first Adam fell when given the choice. And as a result, he is kin to us. He's our kinsman. We've owed an insurmountable debt 
that we could not pay in a thousand lifetimes. There was a guilty verdict that was passed down, and we are deserving of death, but God. Jesus stood up and said, I know that they're guilty, but I will take their place. I will stand in the gap. I've seen the record. I've heard all the accusations. I've read the ledger. I will take the full brunt of your justice so that you can show mercy unto them. I will redeem their debts so they can be reconciled back to you. I'll pay it in full. I will be their kinsman redeemer. Now if I ask the question again, can you articulate what a kinsman redeemer is? I hope you've heard me today. You see, Ruth had grace for labor. She had to first be in that field in order for Boaz to see her. You see, if you read this story, Naomi, when she comes back, she says, don't call me Naomi anymore, call me Mara, because I'm bitter. Both of them lost their husbands. One of them chose to work and to make the best of the situation. The other chose to be bitter. Now, through this situation, Naomi ends up, you know, coming back around, but it was a choice. Ruth could have sat in that room with Naomi, and they just sat around and said, we have no way to provide. We've lost our husbands. What are we supposed to do? But Ruth saw the opportunity, and she said, I'm going to go get it. She had grace for the labor that was required, and as a result, the Lord saw her, and so did Boaz. Had she not been in that field, she would have not been redeemed. It wasn't fun. It was hot, dirty, dusty. She run the risk of, as you said, I've commanded the young man not to touch you, right? She run the risk of those guys bugging her and messing with her. But she chose to surpass all of that to have the grace for the labor that was required. And as a result, she was seen. Most importantly, as a result of all that, she was redeemed. Let's stand. Lord, we're so grateful for your word today and Lord, we ask that we would take these things, Lord, that they would roll over in our spirit, Lord, that you continue to speak to us as we go back even and read through the book, Lord, continue to reveal things to us, and Lord, what it is you're saying. Lord, we're mindful today of our families, and even those that can't be with us today, Lord, remember Carol Lee and Kath and the Gallanters as they travel back and anyone else that's with them, traveling back from Minnesota from that wedding, Lord, be with them. Keep them safe. Watch over them. And Lord, uh, the, our families, Lord, each of us, we consider and we think people in our lives, Lord, that may be struggling with one thing or another, whether it be physical healing or whether they're struggling with some type of anxiety, depression, whatever it is, Lord, we thank you that your name is greater above all things. Lord, we've never seen more obvious that you see us. Lord, we know in the story of Leah when she, she had Simeon that said, Lord, you, you heard my cry. You know that I wanted another son. Just so Jacob might even recognize where who I am and that I'm here. She named her son Simeon. Lord, we're grateful that you hear us. You see us, Lord. Just remind those that are in our lives, God, that are struggling with these things, Lord, that you hear, you hear their cry. You see these situations, O oh God. By your Spirit, come and comfort only the way that you know how to, O oh God. Lord, we send your word, even right now, in the name of Jesus, into those homes, into those lives, 
into their hearts. Settle those minds in Jesus' name. Depression, we come against you in Jesus' name. Your, your work is cursed and broken by the blood of Jesus. Anxious thoughts, you have no part in these lives. We thank you, Lord. We bless your name. Lord, that we can come to you during these times. Maybe in those struggles, we can't even, in our burden, as Naomi, we can't even raise our hands ourselves. We're grateful that we have those around us that love us. And that lift up the hands that hang down. So Lord, it cause us to seek opportunity. To see as you see, O oh God. Use us this week to speak your life into lives. So we go to work or the store or a restaurant. Lord, let us seek opportunity to be able to share your love and kindness to others. We love you today, O oh God. We bless your name. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Have a great week. And remember that you are loved.